everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about open biology, which is culmination of my experiences in academia. I've spent 13 years uh, from starting from BSMS, then PhD, and also time as JRS. Uh, so yeah, so in my talk, I'll be talking about the software, hardware, and uh, the techniques and protocols that uh, that I have come across, which are open source and uh, which are. So uh, let's start with, uh, can you get, tell me what comes to your mind when you hear the word biology? Anyone? Yes, life, cells. Animals, planet, sorry. Organs, yeah. Mitochondria, oh, that's nice. <laughs> so you guys definitely know a lot deeper about biology. So these are just some of the words that I think people think when they uh, talk about biology. And uh, uh, so this is where I want to concentrate on. The biology also refers to the money, patents, and publications. And uh, it's often linked to health and life. And that is why uh, it also, uh, is kind of uh, related to the wealth that people make, and that is by having a lot of patents because biology, most of the biological in innovations, uh, they are patented. And uh, the biological research generally has uh, uh, three components. If you consider the pyramid structure, then the tip of the iceberg is the software. And uh, in my talk, I'll be talking about uh, these three aspects. Let's start with the software. So the most common software that I've used in statistics is R, uh, because um, in ecology and evolution, like you analyze and overanalyze and keep on analyzing data. And uh, the paid counterpart for R is uh, SPSS and uh, origin. So that is what uh, mostly well-funded lab people use. Uh, for image analysis, I've used ImageJ, GIMP, and the paid counterparts are like Photoshop. Uh, for mapping the distribution of species, uh, I've used QGIS, and the paid counterpart is ArcGIS. Uh, for referencing, I've used Mendeley, and uh, the paid counterpart is EndNote. And uh, one other very interesting uh, software that uh, I've used is uh, uh, from a spectrophotometer uh, making uh, a company uh, called Ocean Optics. So they, uh, their uh, software is uh, Ocean View. Uh, so when you buy the spectrophotometer software, and you have to uh, pay for the upgradation in the software, and uh, if you don't want to pay, what they do is uh, the two older uh, like two, uh, the older versions they make it freely available. So that if you are not using the machine anymore, you don't want to pay for the upgrades, you can still analyze some of your data. So that was also very interesting uh, aspect of. Uh, making uh, software uh, free. And also, like R also gives you that freedom to use uh, these spectro uh, photometer data as well. So uh, I didn't have to use this. I had to just use R. So going into a bit more detail, uh, uh, the SPSS actually roughly costs somewhere close to 79,000 per year, which is extremely costly. And uh, R, on the other hand, is free. And the other uh, very useful aspect of R, especially uh, in academia, is uh, somebody publishes a new paper, new technique, or a new method uh, uh, for analysis, and R will have it within months. But uh, that's not the case with these paid softwares. It takes a lot of time for them to incorporate these new analysis into their regime. And some of the uh, common packages that I've used is APE and uh, library, uh, FITE tools for phylogenetic analysis and for visualization, ggplot library and ggtree. So I'll give you a glimpse of like how we use these phylogenetic analysis and the scope of FOSS within this kind of analysis. Phylogeny is basically the history of evolution of species, and it's represented as a tree. You might have seen this kind of tree, right? Like how humans evolved uh, and what their relationships are with primates. So that's what a phylogenetic tree It's nothing but a hierarchical clustering uh, representation with evolutionary relationships. How do you build such phylogenetic tree? You can build it based on DNA, morphology, or any other me uh, measurable feature. right? So DNA-based uh, DNA phylogenetic tree is the most accepted uh, form of tree. And how do you do it? Uh, you have a selected set of genes. You extract the genes. You sequence them. 
Uh, it has uh, four building blocks, ATGC, and then you sequence them, you align them, and then you run the phylogenetic analysis, and then you get the tree. So that's what phylogenetic analysis is. So is it only specific to ecology and evolution? No. So you can use this analysis for pathogen host interactions uh, where you can track how the pathogens have moved from one species through the other species. So you can identify which are the susceptible species. And it can also be used for biodiversity assessment of microorganisms. Like in bioinformatics, the gut microbiota is a fat thing right now, right? So for that, when you want to analyze their relationships, what do you do? You build a phylogenetic tree and look at their uh, relationships. Uh, so where do we need software and why do we need it? So firstly, to edit and align the sequences. And for that, uh, sadly, we have only used Genius, the paid software, because uh, there is no good software that allows you, fr freely available software that allows you to edit and align sequences. And uh, when we are talking about uh, uh, aligning sequences, so we are basically talking about like hundreds of species and your aligning sequences. So Genius is the only software which is paid. Uh, and if you are interested in biology and you feel like you need to contribute, then uh, having a free software for Genius would be very good because we spend like roughly 70, 80,000 rupees per year to get the uh, get the software. And uh, to run the analysis, most uh, softwares are free, so that's fine. And for visualization, ITOL and Figtree are the softwares uh, that are paid, but uh, you can do it very well with R. So that's the good thing. And uh, in our lab, uh, when I was doing PhD, we have completely relied on R. Uh, apart from the statistics, we have also used uh, imaging software like ImageJ to, uh, ident uh, to track the Carpenter B movement. And so basically what we do is we make the videos and then you convert them frame by frame and then mark uh, B in each frame and then look at their path. Uh, that's, uh, again, because it's uh, a free software. It has been helpful. And uh, then uh, spectral clustering is uh, one method that is very well known to the computer science people. But then when we were working on this biological system, we were not satisfied with the statistics that was currently available. So we collaborated with CS department and uh, at uh, ISC. And then we published this paper in an open source journal. And uh, this is where my lack of understanding of FOSS comes in. Like, uh, in academia, we don't know what FOSS is. So 13 years I've spent, I've used uh, open source software very heavily, but then I did not know how to contribute, and I, I, I just couldn't acknowledge, like I didn't know that it needs to be acknowledged. And we still have not uh, made the code public, so it's still sitting in our GitHub repository, which we need to correct now. Uh, now moving on to the open source hardware. So uh, we wanted to build this pump for, uh, air sampling at a regulated uh, time interval or in a regulated manner. So we constructed this flow pump so you can see the versions, uh, how it has evolved over time. Uh, the uh, publication, the, all the data analysis, how, with, uh, how well it works, is published in an open access journal and uh, all the construction details are there freely available on the GitHub if somebody wants to build it on their own. So let me give you a bit of background that why we had to go all the way to construct this. Uh, so this is what we ha I had to do. I wanted to, I was interested in evolution of fragrances, how the, why different flowers have different fragrances and how they have evolved. For uh, that, I have to collect the fragrances. What we do is we send the air in at a regulated manner and then we collect it at a regulated manner. So you, you need two uh, flow pumps to uh, collect one sample, right? And uh, like most biological systems, we have a time limit. So uh, since I was working with plants, uh, flowering season for my plants is three months. And the number of species that I had to work with were 23. And uh, I need at least five samples for each species, right? So that makes it like total 115 species. And I was working in the Northeast, so most of the days it would rain, so I cannot sample those days. So the number of days in which I had to do this sampling was even lesser. So for that, because each sample requires two pumps, so I need roughly 40 pumps, right? So uh, the commercially available pump that when we inquired costs roughly around 97,000 rupees. If I need 20 units, then I, it would cost me around 20 lakhs, right? Uh, and, um, which, and what I need is 
40 units, which is roughly close to 40 lakhs. And in ecology and evolution generally, more than 10 lakhs grant is a very big deal. So having 40 lakhs just for a small instrument, which will keep going bad because you are out there in the rains, uh, is impossible to imagine. Uh, so we built this flow pump where each unit cost 14,000 and uh, so 40 units would cost me just 5 lakhs. So 5 lakhs versus 40 lakhs, right? So open hardware and uh, because it has helped, me, uh, helped us a lot, so we made it open source and we gave out all the codes because in other countries, like a lot of people were approaching us for the codes and so we had made it open source. So if they want to build it in their country, then they can do it. So other open source hardwares in biology uh, is uh, something called open PCR. So PCR is a machine, uh, a PCR stands for a polymerase chain reaction, so which you use to amplify the genes, different genes. And uh, the well-known brands, it costs somewhere close to like $5,000 to $20,000. But uh, this open PCR machine is 100% free. If you want to build on your own, then the 3D graph, uh, the 3D, um, uh, what is it called? Um, 3D design, yeah, 3D design is freely available uh, and uh, everything else around it is freely available. But then if you want to use their kit, which comes with all the box and everything, you can get their kit, which is just $500, so which is cheaper than an iPhone, right? Uh, uh, which again is very helpful. It's not completely free, but at the same time, good. Uh, then uh, microscope. Microscope is another very essential aspect of biology. And uh, there are these full scopes, uh, which uh, cost less than $1 to build. And uh, they're, they're freely available, uh, not, I shouldn't say freely available, but uh, anybody can build it. So their whole structure is uh, available. And they are quite affordable. Uh, now moving on to open techniques and protocols in uh, biology. Uh, so uh, in ecology and evolution, where I uh, have worked mostly, so most of the techniques and protocols are free. So we don't have any patented technology as such in ecology and evolution. But then molecular biology people, they have tons and tons of techniques which are uh, patented and which are closed source. So DNA isolation, gene transfer technology, gene expression technology, anything that you can think in uh, terms of uh, molecular biological experiments starting from identification of the gene to identifying what function it does and how if there is a problem with that gene, how do you fix it. So all these steps, every step requires you to have some dependence on either the software, hardware, or the techniques and the tools. Uh, but then they are not freely available. So when I was uh, reading more about these techniques and protocols, uh, in, like if there are any uh, techniques or protocol which are out of patent or which uh, uh, are freely available, uh, I didn't find any. But then I found this uh, BIOS project, uh, which is Biological Innovation for Open Society by Cambia Labs in Australia. So they follow a kind of a software model, uh, uh, software, uh, uh, like a FOSS kind of model. So what they say is uh, they allow you to have, uh, get your uh, techniques or like an innovation patented, uh, but uh, with a clause that whatever new innovation you do, you have to give it back to the community free of cost, whatever the new development you do to, after using the technology. And uh, it's uh, free for uh, the uh, research institutes, like the academic institutes, and uh, for nonprofits. But if you are coming for profit, then when you request it, you have to pay some amount. So which seems like a quite a nice uh, idea, right? Like, you know, you, it doesn't have to be completely free, but at the same time, uh, it's good. Uh, then uh, now, is it possible to have open biology, right? Like we are talking about the open source software, hardware, and techniques and protocols. So it's still difficult because incentives to not have your um, innovations patented is very less in India. Or I would say, I don't know of any incentive uh, which the government or anybody gives you to not get your uh, um, innovation patented. Right, and in uh, today's time, like most of uh, the faculties that I know in uh, all these big government institutions, so there the government is kind of the institution is forcing every uh, faculty to have collabor industry collaboration and get something or the other patented. So we are kind of like moving away from having open biology. We are moving towards like getting everything uh, patented. Uh, 
Uh, then comes the credit credibility and biosecurity. So if I am investing so much time, right? So uh, and I take some open source uh, technology or like you know some protocol, then how do I know that it's credit credible, right? Like uh, because I don't want to uh, use that protocol and waste my uh, resources and my time. And then if I have developed something and I give it out, then how do I uh, get a credit for it? Right? And what about the biosecurity? Now, once you make everything open source in biology, now anybody, because the genes and everything, every those things, the, that kind of data is already open source. So if you have all that information, somebody can actually uh, develop uh, bioweapons. Uh, so I think for things like that, having a BIOS kind of system is good, because that way the technology is still uh, you know, uh, in check and uh, people can still access it at affordable rates while also getting all like solving all these problems. And uh, if uh, you want to contribute to FOSS uh, in biology and also like to towards making the dream of uh, uh, open biology true, then how can you contribute? So firstly, we need uh, biologists because they are the expert dom uh, domain experts. So they need to identify what the problem is and find the right collaborator because you can spend years and years, you know, learning how to do machine learning for your problem, but then somebody in CS can do it in months, right? And um, and then so this whole idea comes mostly from because I'm from academia and I did not know what FOSS is. Uh, so, um, so the students can uh, or from other departments, they can help by creating and maintaining FOSS for biology, create and maintain open hardware for biology, and uh, the academia can promote interdisciplinary education so that the biologists can also understand the language of a software developer or a hardware developer, right? So that is also important. And uh, uh, the academic course instructors can introduce FOSS to the students and uh, FOSS projects can actually be incorporated in the uh, as a uh, project course project to the students so that way the students we can contribute to FOSS uh, at the same time they can also learn about uh, how to uh, they, they can improve their CV right uh, yeah so one spoke uh, uh, broken will stop the wheel from turning and that's what exactly happens in biology so it has so the innovations in biology has so many steps that even if one thing is missing then you cannot move towards open biology so open biology has to move like the software hardware and techniques and protocols together yeah that's it thank you so if you have question i don't think i have much time maybe a minute okay i can take one or two questions Yes. You mentioned the fragrance experiment you had done. Sorry? The experiment related to the fragrance you had done. Yes, yes. What was the outcome and what were the next steps? How did you follow it up? Uh, so uh, uh, we are still working in that field. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at the evolution of fragrances. And uh, the hardware part was just one of the protocols. And uh, what we found, like it's a genus called Hedicium. I'm not sure if you're interested in it. But a genus called Hedicium, which is like a ginger lily. So what we found is that uh, they, the species have day and night fragrance patterns. And uh, the species, uh, at daytime, they pr uh, produce a different kind of fragrance. And nighttime, they produce a different kind of fragrance. And the species which evolved in India uh, have different kind of uh, fragrance pattern as compared to species that evolved in uh, Southeast Asia. So yeah, so that kind of, uh, so and it's still an ongoing project. So we are yet to publish this whole work. Yeah. Yes. Hello. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I had a question. So you spoke about designing your own open hardware to like collect fragrance. Could you mm -hmm. Talk about what that device does. So that device uh, allows you to uh, collect fragrance at a regulated. Um, so it basically, s um, when you make the chamber, you would need to send the air at a regulated manner, right? Like let's say 300 ml per second or per minute, you have to send in. And when you collect the fragrance, you, that also has to be collected at a regulated air uh, regulated manner. So this device, what it allows you to do is it allows you to regulate the airflow. 
So we can measure like uh, how much air uh, is flowing out. So you attach a flow meter, which lets you know how much, what is the flow meter, and then you can regulate it. You can set a timer for it, like you want to collect it for one hour, then it will beep. Uh, and it also has lightings, so that when, because we also collect it at night, right, fragrances, so it also allows you to connect, uh, look at, locate the device at night, because it has a faint red color light, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, analysis of the fragrances, we do it in GCMS machine. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. So I think my time is up. If you guys want to talk, then I'll be available today. So yeah. Thank you, everyone.